Hello, right, welcome to my podcast, uh, Joe Baines Comedy, and I have Rodders. Hello. Rodders here. Good Hello. Oh, sorry, not the yes, camera right so here. We're, uh, we're knocking uh, the camera it's around. An earthquake. Yay. Uh, we're in Edinburgh, so there are no earthquakes here. Uh, so, Rodders, tell me, uh, what's your full name, by the way? Well, because real, all I know full is name, My full name is Rodri David Kenneth Buttrick. Uh, How my did I survive school? Yes, barely. <laughs> and did, did you get picked on by that name in school? Uh, well, there's lots of. I was a butt of many jokes. As a, uh, but yeah, my surname well, attracts a lot of attention, but no more so than most people. Like yeah. it didn't really. I, I was lucky in the fact that I wasn't really bullied. I can normally talk my way out of it. The thing I did do, I'd often write jingles for the bullies. So they'd be like, if they needed to write a mean song penned about yeah. a teacher or someone. I do. I write it for them because they lacked what they had in brawn. They lacked in imagination. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I would. Uh, I guess be their uh, their copywriter. And what do you do now? Um, what um, job or job wise everything? Yeah. Uh, my, my job now for the last year, my nine to five has been uh, doing uh, IT support on a helpline. Um, and prior to that, I worked in radio for six years. Uh, I was a freelance presenter, producer and travel news reader. I did that from when I graduated to last year and I still dabble in radio. I get to, I'm very lucky to get to work for KISS FM in Portugal. Every couple of months I'll fly out there, do some events, do some radio and I still record stuff from this country. Um, well not this country, uh, being Scotland, I mean England. So uh, hang on, you center. work in a call centre? Yes. Isn't that stealing jobs from brown people? I know, it's a terrible thing I've done there, isn't it? In fact, we've only... I don't think how many. Do we have any Indians? Possibly. They're. Yeah, they're maybe, no maybe, I've, maybe I've nicked a job. You've oh, stolen a job. I'm going to have to report this to the Indian <laughs> I can't embassy. remember whose joke it is. There's someone who goes on about, oh, um, an immigrant. I tried to steal my job and then decided not to because it was too rubbish. Um, <laughs> maybe they're becoming more selective now. They are, yeah. There yes, are some jobs are, yeah. that I think a lot of people yeah. would just turn their nose up. Well, Indians are becoming, you know, working their way up, and now being a call center operative is no longer, you know, their passion in life. So they're building the. So what's is it anyone's passion? Oh, I really. Yeah. Oh, I'm passionate about customer service. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy it. Like it's fun. I spend all the time on on the phone. I mean, not yeah. fixing computers. I'm just on the phone. <laughs> but no, it is a nice job because you get to talk to people. And I was recruited, I think, on the basis of because I've got no IT experience. Um, I, I think I was recruited off the basis of my telephone manner and my people skills, essentially. Yeah. Um, because they just give you a script, right? No. No? No, oh, no. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it's a university, uh, so it could be professors, it could be students, it could be staff, and all my emails not working, and or, oh God, I've lost my dissertation, those are the frightening calls. Uh, and then sometimes they put us out at a help desk in the library and people come to us for problems like, oh, my laptop's gone funny, or the worst ones are, uh, uh, my dissertation is on this, and they hold a memory stick out that looks like it's been run over. It's like, can you retrieve it? We're like, well, no. <laughs> uh, those are the worst. Those are the worst moments is when you can't save someone's dissertation. Wow. Always back up your data. Yeah. Cloud storage is very affordable. <laughs> it's true. Do you back up? Um, is, yes. this, is this going to be backed up on some yes, sort? Yes, it is. Good. It, it, this is going straight onto YouTube uh, and Pornhub. I mean, uh, just, just YouTube. Just <laughs> don't, YouTube yeah. don't back your, your um, uh, dissertation up on Pornhub. Um, <laughs> Maybe do, that is a good place to back it up. Be a bit of a niche, shouldn't there? I guess there's a fetish or anything. Oh, look at that really um, complicated theory about uh, economics. Whoa. Oh, Whoa. That's turning me on. Yeah. Yes. So, so what... Um, so what do you do for work? Uh, um, so what do you do for work now? You you work in the radio station, or? Oh no no! I just told you oh, I work in an oh, okay. it's oh. my nine to five. I used oh. to work for six years. I worked in radio. In fact, from when I was nine, my dream when I was if you if you got nine year old Rodri uh, before it called itself Rodders, if you got nine year old Rodri and said. Um, what do you want to be? All I wanted to be was a radio presenter. So I was never very good at school, but I've always been able to talk a lot. Um, Which is what you, how you escape exactly, the bullies. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you talk your way out of anything. But it's like, that's all I wanted to do. And I kind of achieved it. I got out of university. My first job was at Reading 107 FM, now defunct radio station, got bought out by a company. But uh, I got that job. I, got, I was a Saturday night presenter. I used to pres present 6 till 9 p.m. every Saturday night. 
and I got that job by literally banging on the door because I'd emailed them demo after demo after demo and they ignored me so I banged on the door yes. and like the program controller walked down the stairs looking very confused having not read any of my emails and I was so lucky because at the time the station boss had said look we need to get some more local voices on the air um, and so I you ended up there. right place right time so I started presenting an evening show there um, and, and what's your um, passion in life? I don't know, that's, that's a hard question. Um, I think my two favourite activities, I love doing it. It was radio. It was part, very much past tense now, because I still like it as a medium. I love podcasting. I've got my yeah. own podcast. But it just became so difficult to make money and make a living. Because um, I started off as like the main cover presenter for the Breeze Network, uh, or, or at least the, the Breeze in Basingstoke and Southampton. And where is every local branch of the, It's like a network of stations like Heart. You have a local station and then certain shows go out from their HQ so they don't have to pay another job. But we always used to have a local breakfast, a local drive. I always used to get to cover local drive. And they got rid of that and just networked it from the HQ. So suddenly the show, it was, it was quite well paid that bit. It was one of the few things in radio that was okay paid. A lot of it was just like seven pound an hour handing out car stickers, kind of rubbish. Yeah. But like, once that had gone, that's a huge chunk of my work evaporated. So gradually, the wheels fell off the radio dream and I ended up reading travel news in Farringdon in London for nine pound an hour, which if you know anything about commuting from Reading to London, nine pound an hour isn't a big enough wage to make a living and I just thought I can't go on like this I haven't got a future and I wanted to carry on doing more stand-up but yeah. stand-up's very hard to make money in so every time I went and did a gig in god knows where for not much money I feel really guilty because I was living at home still and I was thinking um, I should really be getting a proper job I say I've only just uh, two weeks ago I moved out three weeks ago well the done first time I've had the capital to, to do it bizarrely yeah. enough but, but yeah, yeah, sorry, that was a massive tangent. You asked me what my passions are. To so answer that concisely, stand-up comedy yeah. and uh, rock climbing. Those are my oh, two. Oh yes, I've seen I've seen your things. rock climb video. He's, he's like a Spider-Man, basically. This is the uh, English Spider-Man. Uh. The thing is, people ask me if you like rock climbing so much, why don't you marry it? Because it's not legal in this country yet. Could be. Could be the way the country I mean, is going. It's twenty eighteen, yeah. but we're not that liberal. I can't, yeah. I can't marry concepts or activities. Imagine uh, you're at the uh, at the registrar, and there's a, a rock climbing a wall next to you. A hunk of rock. Do you take this rock to be a lawful wedded wife? You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not assume it has a gender. Well, by then we'll be well, everything will be gender neutral as well. I think oh, you know, no, the French are still going to keep that. French have female tables and mental, aren't they? That's true. And, and so that. do the Germans. Yeah, so do the Germans. They also have uh, certain gender stuff in their language. What gender is the uh, toilet in a female toilet in France? That's a question I'd like to know. The answer to. I don't know. I don't know. Do you, do you know? No. No, it's, no. it's, it's a genuine yeah. question. Any well, linguists out there will be so annoyed at that question they probably turn this off. Sorry, I've lost your audience. That's fine. No, all I three know. of them. All three of them, yeah. No, I do like comedy. I do, I do like rock climbing. But I, yes. I like doing them both in not at the same time. Although there must be a way to combine. Yeah, this is what I was thinking. Show. It, know, can you do a show <laughs> where you brought your own rock climbing wall? You're could rock you, climbing. Could you imagine the insurance bill? I don't know, but if it's if it's you wouldn't need insurance if it was a small wall. And maybe you're hanging and on the would, wall and would something. be pointless. I don't know. I mean, is there a way that you could climb and... I don't I'm know. sure there is. I'm I'll, sure I'll, there I'll is. work on it. But yeah. they're, they're not... Neither activity... Of, uh, I, feel, I find neither of them particularly easy. Uh, but I like them because they're so very different. And I, I think if I just did stand-up comedy, I'd yeah. go mad. If I just did rock climbing, I'd go mad. Because they're both very stressful in very, very different, different ways. ways. Yeah, so if, true, yeah. if, if you have both at the same time, I find it kind of balances me out. And also, comedy's really unhealthy. Like, I've been eating junk all week, I've been drinking all week, and like, you, you spend a lot of time traveling, sitting down, and you have a lot of late nights, and you're very tired, but you haven't actually done much physical activity. So it's not a healthy lifestyle, so you need something to keep you physically in shape. And for me, that's, that's rock climbing. That's rock climbing, yeah. But it helps you, you know, healthy, all that stuff about healthy body, healthy mind. It isn't just a load of hippie nonsense, guys, it's science. Yeah. I mean, I can write better material if I've been climbing and active more. It's like, just everything works better and yes. I don't feel so tired. 
Well, I joined the gym. The first thing I did when I got here was join the Redison gym. And I spend one to two hours there every day. Oh, I was too committed. I can, I'm just lucky enough to drag myself out of bed and to do my show, which is an absolute crack of dawn. But then your show is at 11 in the morning. It is. Wow. Well, if you want to come back in time and yes. see this, oh, it's going to be mirror image, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's fun. Oh, it doesn't help. <laughs> It doesn't matter. No, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we've been, and you've been on uh, three times, haven't you? We've been doing Murph in the Morning, a comedy compilation show. You know, that is the earliest I've ever gone up. It's crazy. And the reason the, I wanted... at the fringe. It is, yeah. If you're thinking 11 a.m., that's a line. Not at the fringe when it's it's basically a. Uh, th there are gigs going on all night long. So sometimes, like, I was booked to do a late night show the other night, and I was like, well, I've got a four hours to sleep here. And I, I get up, I get out, uh, and I start flying around nine ish. Yeah, and then the, the reason I, I help you with your morning thing is because it, it gives me a reason to get out of bed early. Otherwise, I would uh, I would not get up. I, I don't think I'd surface till about ten or eleven if I wasn't doing this show. Yeah, uh, and it's it, it's good in the way because it has stopped me drinking so much because it's so easy to get so carried away. Yes, because I was doing. Well, the first time I turned around was 2014. I did your show. Uh, what was it called? Um, License to Laugh. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I do, I I do that, spots yeah. in the daytime. So generally, I do two a day. I do a lunchtime show and I do your spot at midnight. Uh, so, um, But now I'm doing like four spots a day. Um, I cramped it up a bit. Well but, done. Yes. No, I am enjoying it. Like, um, comedy can be very satisfying. When when uh, when you enjoy it, yes. I also think I think sometimes you have to learn to enjoy it, and it's taken me a little while. It's taken me a few years. Like Twenty fifteen, I nearly quit because I was I was just like I was putting myself under way too much pressure. Yeah, it's not really very important. Like nobody, if I do a terrible job, no one will remember. If I do a great job, no one will remember. So why beat yourself up? I'm not saying don't go too far and. Otherwise, if I had that attitude, I wouldn't get out of bed. But you've got to have a bit of perspective. Whereas yeah. I was putting myself under so much pressure, and I was—I was, remember I was—I was doing a show at the Reading Fringe 2015, and it was like I wanted this 20 to be the best 20 I'd ever done. And there was a huge segment that just didn't work, and it was like there's this metal albatross around my neck. I refused just to put down, and I'd go out night after night, and it wouldn't work, and I'd just get more and more angry about it. And I would have been better off either just cutting my set short. Or just yeah. not doing, or just, and once I admitted that bit wasn't any good, and I once I thought, well, actually, the comedians I watch on telly have been doing this for decades. I'm not. I should. I should be nice to myself, not beat myself up just because I'm not as good as them. Yeah. But equally, because we, I, I we like compare, that. we compare all there's, the time. Yeah. There's um, there's um, a line. You have to be thin-skinned enough to sense when you're not doing well. Because if, if if you're too thick-skinned. You go out there, you bomb every night, and you go, oh, I don't care, yeah, screw that audience. Whereas, like, I want to, I can, I can sense when an audience is losing patience. It's like, I, I can feel it. Yeah. It's like a, an alarm goes off in my head, and I go, right, get to the punchline, get off stage, because you've, you've just about gone a bit, you've out stage to welcome me. And I, you must always have that awareness, but at the same time, I shouldn't be beating myself up mentally over it. Yeah. You've got to be, yes. it's a balancing act. There's a, Fine tight rope to apply the correct amount of pressure so you make something creative and wonderful and arty, uh, but not so much that you can't sleep at night and you want to cry. <laughs> well, what's your um, uh, yeah? I remember when I started comedy, I there was times when I did want to get run over by a bus. Uh, what's your um, what what makes so I in my so my podcast is about laugh, learn, and love. And I think those three encompass life. So what makes you laugh? Um, I've got quite a strange sense of humour. I quite okay. like it. And it probably goes back from school. I was, I was, I'm very dyslexic, so I was never very, very good at school. Yeah. But I could always make people laugh. And there's a thing, I, I have this thing now where like, I do some quite absurdist things on stage. And I like that sense of getting one over. So if someone thinks I'm an idiot, I think I've won. I've got one over. Like there was someone the other day. There was an act who was he was showing off some headshots he got done. I mean, who does that? <laughs> like he he got some nice headshots done, and I was sitting opposite him in a in a crowded little green room of a gig. And I said, I looked at him deadpan and said, "Mate, um, you're gonna have to have those redone." And he looked up at me and said, "Why?" And he was he was sitting opposite me with his phone like that, and uh, he said, "He said why? Why have I got to get them redone?" I said, "They've been taken upside down." 
and he thought I was being serious. And now he <laughs> thinks I'm an idiot, I think. Um, and there's a glimmer of me that thinks, ah, I've got one over. I like playing with people in yeah. a very, it's a harmless way. It's not mean. But at the same time, I also feel a bit sad because another person thinks I'm an idiot. Um, I don't know, I like... I like stuff, my favourite comedian's Paul Foot. I could talk about him for hours, I'm not going to, but like, yeah. I could, because his stuff is so wacky, so stupid, so absurd, but then underneath it, when you look carefully, it's actually very well thought through, and there's some, uh, even, even there's like political points and points about homophobia in there, but it's, it's buried under him pretending to be a shire horse. I think the, I like the unpretentiousness, because he could do this very highfalutin, because he's very, very clever. I mean, he's got a maths degree from, Oxford or Cambridge wow. or something. He could, whereas like he's, he does this absurd thing, where he doesn't need to prove how clever he is because he knows he's clever, which is a very natural way of being. I don't like uh, things that are unpretentious. There's nothing wrong with comedy that's just out there to make you laugh. And I think I like. I like. I don't know what I like. I like Paul Foot. I like um, a lot of comedians called Paul. Paul F. Taylor. I like him a lot. Um, Stuart Lee. I've only start. I've got. I'm very late to the party. I've. Uh, um, uh, I've moved into a house share and we, we've got a Netflix. Um, so I've been watching the third series of Stuart Lee's Comedy Vehicle, which is like, it must be like four years old. Now. Yeah, that's right. But what like, I, I was good. turned off by him for all the wrong reasons. It's not his fault. It's because every open mic I go to, there's someone going, oh, submerting the comedy. And it's like everyone's doing this crap Stuart Lee impression. Yeah. So by default, I thought, well, look, I can't be dealing with this. And then when I did watch him, I didn't get it. it was kind of an exaggerated character. So oh, I just, him, yeah. I, I took, I, I took uh, Stuart Lee to be whatever the bad impersonators were doing. Plus, I took the actual Stuart Lee on face value. So basically, I didn't understand it for a good five years. Um, but now I've started watching. I was like, well, actually, this is a sort of comedy I couldn't do and I shouldn't do because it's not me. But yeah. God, it's enjoyable. I love the fact it's so, it's, he's so kind of derisive and petty, but also very, very silly. Just his use of words. And I just like that he gets very angry about some very trivial things. Like that there's bit he goes on about how he doesn't read Harry Potter because he's a 40 year old man. He's like, oh, Harry Potter and the, and the mitten of wool. And it's just so beautifully dismissive. Like, I quite like that in, in him. But yeah, so I've come very late to the party of him. I like well, him now. Well, at least you're, you're there. I like him now, and yeah. I, I don't mind admitting I was wrong about a performer for a while. Plus, he doesn't give a crap who I am, so yeah. it doesn't matter. <laughs> for me to say, oh, I don't like Stuart Lee, he's going to be like... <laughs> who cares, right? Who cares? Exactly. So, so what makes you... Uh, what, what have you learned in life that you think is profound or has changed your life or in any way affected your life? So that thing I told you about comedy, yeah. applying the right amount of pressure. Um, and just like I've become much more short termist in the fact that I used to have this big, well, a lot of comedians have this big five year plan. Yeah. I feel I should address why I've got two watches on us. Yeah, I, was, I just absurd. saw that and I was yeah. like, why has he got two watches? There is, that, there is a very practical reason that also exposes me as a bit of an idiot. But um, going back, you've got to. What was I on about? Oh, God. Oh, big, what makes you... Yeah, you know, what have you not. learned? What have you learned in life? Oh, yeah, I've yeah. become very short term mystery because, like, a lot of comedians, they'll have a five-year plan. Oh, I want to be on telly by the time I'm doing this. And I, I used to be like that with it. Now, I'm much more like, well, how can I get this new bit of material? How can I get that promoted to book me? How can I do a set about this? How can I do the best in this particular room that's mostly full of drunk people? <laughs> So I think literally like a gig or a joke at a time, I'm so much happier. Yeah. I'm not stressing because I'm trying to live more in the now. That's In fact, that's good. the best things about rock climbing and about comedy. When you're really in the moment in comedy, you're not, when, when there's those, the, the, you get these moments of clarity when you're not back timing, you're not thinking, oh, what's my next joke? You're saying the stuff, you're connecting. It's not like you're reading a script, maybe you're ad-libbing but you are existing only in that moment and the future and the past doesn't exist. And rock climbing, when I'm, I don't know, 50 meters off the ground, desperately scrabbling for a hold, all I can, I'm so scared, all I can think about is that, that next move I've got to do. And, and I know I can, you can feel every sinew in your body yeah. hoping that that rock, bit of rock will hold. And so it, did you have these moments of clarity? Whereas, as I am now, I'm mostly, I'm far more about, um, more concerned with the past and the future than the present. 
I'm constantly thinking, oh, well, I could have done that better. Oh, let's plan for the future. So yeah. for the most time, the, the present is, is not relevant to me. I kind of gloss over it, which is a shame because I'm probably missing out on living. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And what, um, what do you um, laugh, learn, love? What, have you, what do you love in life? What's that's a your... really open-ended question. Yeah. Like, that's really well, like, I like comedy a lot. And I don't, I don't know, because like, the second thing I've kind of learned is more about life in general, because my whole life was all about getting on the radio. And it happened. And then slowly my dream was sort of eroded bit by bit. And I thought, oh God, I'm going to have to do a nine to five. This is going to be awful. Yeah. Um, but it's been the weirdest, most liberating thing ever. Because now I know how much money I've got. I could, I would be here in Edinburgh if I hadn't got my IT job because I couldn't afford it. Yeah. I've got my own little place I'm renting now, and I'm just much more settled and happy. So it's just like I don't know what the lesson is to take away from that. Being chained to a desk from nine to five is actually very liberating. Is that a lesson? There must be a broader thing you can yeah, draw. Yeah, of course. From. Yeah, and, and what, 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 what would you give the audience there over what? there? What, what, what message would you give the audience oh, about life? I, oh, life! I'd give them a, um, a yogurt. No. Um, Life is like a tube of toothpaste. You really hope it contains toothpaste. Because if it doesn't, you've been, they've missold it. Uh, but you might get something nicer. Like chocolate. Like chocolate. Um, I don't know, because I kind of thought, I thought my life was going terribly wrong. And then suddenly it's like, well actually, I've come out the other side and this is, this is better. And now yeah. I'm doing an Edinburgh show, which is just like, and I'm like, I, I run a com and oh, the other thing I love, I love my comedy club. I love oh, my yeah, comedy yeah. club. Stand up and deliver, right? Stand and deliver, yeah, you, you played it, played it yes. once, haven't you? Yeah, yeah I played it once, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. A really nice room. Very it's, nice. It's, room, it's been yeah. running two and a half years, and like, I never thought I'd run a comedy club. And when I started it, I thought, ah, this will make it to night three. But two and a half years later, it's still going, and the venue, Smoking Billies, are so behind it. Because I was like, oh, I don't want to do an August show, it'll be hard to sell tickets. And they were like, sod it, do it anyway. Don't be a defeatist, get on with it. Because if you don't do a show in August, we lose momentum for September. And I thought, well, that's what you want, isn't it? You want a venue that kind of has your back and yeah, encourages you. Yeah, it's very you. hard to find venues like that. Because like, we've, we've been here for quite a while, so they kind of, they, um, the owner trusts me now. We kind of like, it's a much, it, it, it's very much, because often there's a divide promoter versus venue, but we're, very, we're the same thing in the sense, because we both want bums on seats, and we want those bums to laugh. I don't yeah. want the bums to laugh, that sounds awful, doesn't it? But uh, we want people to come and watch the shows and enjoy themselves. And off the back of that, the venue will make money off the beer sales, and good for them. That's exactly. what it's about, yeah, yeah, it? of course it is, yeah. Comedy's uh, all about selling beer, and I'm perfectly comfortable with that as an idea. At the end of the day, you've got to pay the bills. You have. Got to oh, pay the bills. Because the owner is actually called Bill. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why he pays the bills, right? Probably. And, and what's your show about here? It's a compilation. I need to cover why I'm doing this, or else I'm going to forget. Um, because this is an analog watch to tell me the time. This is a stopwatch to tell me how long I've been on stage. Uh, why don't I? Uh, yeah, that's just my have this telling me the time. Is that yeah. right? It's because um, I can't operate this watch. I can't set the time correctly on it. It's wrong, and it, the alarm will randomly go off at any moment during the day, and I've lost the instructions. And the only la lady who could do it was a, a, a news editor called Louise that used to work at the Breeze radio station. She then left the Breeze before I did, um, and she's now gone to work at another radio station, and I haven't seen her since. Uh, so therefore, there is nobody <laughs> with the capability to set this watch, so I just have to have two. It's far simpler than trying to wow. work it out myself. It's laziness, really. Do people in the street come up to you and go, um, excuse me, why have you got two watches? <laughs> Time travelling. Um, no, it's because um, usually I take one off. I have the front pocket oh, of my bag that okay. contain my phone charger. Yeah. Uh, usually this watch, and then my, my pre-gig ritual, take this watch off, put this one on, and it's like all I because I don't want to know the time when I'm on stage. I just because yeah. I do, I need to I took I put my phone on flight mode as well, um, and then I and then I can just focus on the gig and I just need to know how many minutes I've done. Uh, oh, nine! I did nine minutes and ten seconds at your gig. I was bang on time. Oh, were you? That's that perfect. Um, well, the, the, the thing is, I, I was thinking if you're on the tube or the train, and um, sitting there with two watches on, could somebody think, oh? Is he a terrorist? Why is he wearing two watches? Why do they have to be very punctual? Have they got I have no idea. Multiple I have no idea. Zones? I'm just thinking, you know, like we're always looking for 
a reason why somebody's a terrorist, right? Are we? So it could be. I don't know. I, I, am. I, I am. I am. I'm, I'm lo always looking for uh, uh, the good in people. Yeah, no, I'm not saying... The good in people's a... handbags, especially. Five bob. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just leave all your money behind. Really? Yeah, all but... right. Thank you very much. That was good. No that was worries. Good. Yeah. Thanks for doing it. It's Murph in the Morning, my show. Yeah, You've been there on you it go. twice. Um, That's true, yeah. It's Brilliant. just been a comedy compilation show. It's me and a load of acts. And it's, it's been fun, isn't it? It's, it was, You've done the Fringe loads. Yeah, this is my third or fourth one this and year. And like, yeah. you gave me my first shot at the Fringe in 2014. Oh, yeah. Then, like, that was only the only other time I've been. So like, yeah. this has been mad. I've, I've learned so much just from performing every day. Yeah, um, you will. Yeah, 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 it's great. I love it's it. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, well, we've we've... Finally, I've come clean about the watch thing because I know everyone online was asking about that. So now people in the street won't ask me about it. Um, yeah, because so, yeah. this goes out to millions of viewers. <laughs> so yeah, if, if you want to find me, uh, rodders.com, rhdrs.com. I've got a podcast as well. Where I chat I'll put the link to it. Joe, you've been on it. Yep, I'm on it. I'll, I'll put the link to everything that Rodders is everywhere so you can follow him quite easily. But the easiest way to follow Rodders, by the way, it's just on foot. Just follow him around a foot, that's the only way. I've got uh, a very bad memory and not the best eyesight, so I probably you'll probably get away with it for many months. Exactly, so you need to stay close basically. The KGB have can... been in the front row of my gig all week and I, yeah. I hadn't noticed. Oh, You're what's not... your name? Blood <laughs> Right, brilliant, thank you very much. That's. Um...